So um, I'm very pleased today to have here we have two makers um, who have become curators. And you'll hear something about that, some similar reasons, but in very different ways. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Sandy Simon. Uh, Sandy's a ceramicist and has worked as a maker with functional pottery throughout her career. And she is also a curator and founded and runs Trax Gallery in Berkeley, California, uh, which specializes in showing functional studio pottery. And then Leslie my on my um, Leslie Miller, who is Professor of Textile Culture at the University for the Creative Arts, Epsom, UK. Um, a practicing weaver for many years, she is a uh, internationally known curator specializing in contemporary textiles. So I think what we're just going to do, we uh, like this to be somewhat informal and get a chance for you to ask your questions. But we'll start out um, by asking yeah, each one, we'll start with Leslie. Um, talk about how they came from being makers to curators, and um, also to have done some other things. Okay, um, I started out life as a, as a silk weaver, mm -hmm. and I wanted to make silk, but I could just throw it in the air, and it would just float down, you know, very far And then I went to an exhibition in London of Navajo blankets, and these extraordinary textiles just jumped off the wall at me. They were so full of, you know, contained energy. And I thought, I want something like that. That's what I want to do. So I moved from doing big silk weave uh, to doing uh, rugs. And slowly, slowly over the years, my rugs started to stories. Uh, not stories that anybody could see because they were abstract, geometric pieces. But for me, they had a story in them. And slowly the story became more important than the rug itself. So I moved over to being a tapestry weaver. And as one develops, um, the tapestries moved from being uh, uh, decorative uh, to being more and more political, and more and more overtly political and engaged with issues. And I became very much what would be called an issue-based artist. And, um, it seems so hard now for people to remember. I mean, I talk to students and they just can't believe what I'm saying. But in the 1990s, it was very difficult to show textiles. But if you were a textile artist working uh, politically with issues, just forget it. Nobody was interested at all. The art galleries weren't interested, the, the municipal galleries weren't interested because, you know, no. Uh, there was no community interest in what you were doing. It was just, there was nothing. Anyway, the, the, um, there was one gallery which took myself and a group of people on as an exhibition. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, we were all booked to give a talk about our work to the public. And when I pitched up, I was the only one who did. Or none of the other artists turned up. So I had to talk about everybody else's work, which was the first time I really had to do that. And, I found that I actually understood what people were doing at a very quite a deep level. And I engaged with the audience quite well. And the uh, person who ran the gallery said to me afterwards, have you ever thought about curating an exhibition? And I said, no. And she said, would you like to? And I said, okay. And she said, what would you like to do it on? And I went, well, issue-based artist, you know, what, you know, this is what, you know, see if we can start to find some really major venues. And that's how I started uh, in 1994, on a very hot summer's day, um, taking the exhibition down and agreeing to, um, to curate another exhibition. And what I found out from doing this was that I, first of all, don't do small. I, I'm congenitally incapable of doing something small. This was a small um, gallery in uh, Maidstone, and which is a small, very small town in Kent. And I put together an international exhibition including this, um, uh, of, of artists who were using textiles to look at issues of contemporary concern. And we got it to the Barbican, um, which was an amazing breakthrough at that time. And I'd taken on a Japanese artist as part of the exhibition, and she said, why don't we try and go take exhibitions to Japan? And I thought, oh, you can tell. 
Well, in fact, we managed to get the exhibition to Japan, and not just to Japan, but to the National Museum of Modern Art in Japan, in Kyoto. And from then on, I just, I realized that I had a mission in life. I mean, I knew that I wanted to um, promote contemporary textile practice, but from then on, I knew that that's what I had to do. I actually wanted to change the mindset of the establishment in the UK about contemporary textile practice and make and try and get them to prioritize to understand what they had in their collections which were mostly hidden and to also prioritize contemporary practice and that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 15 years um, organizing exhibitions seminars conferences writing trying to generate um, the, uh, um, uh, a climate where those of us who are doing this incredibly exciting work, I mean, you talk about textiles, this is this huge umbrella and the most amazing work is going on underneath that umbrella. The best that I think there is at this time. So, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started on the old tracks in 1995 in California where I lived at the time, living now, because I could not get a gallery to show my work see that a lot of people whose work I respected, who were potters who go to their life and making pots, no one really had a nice place to show their work. Yeah. There was nowhere to go to see the pots. And we, uh, my husband Bob and I owned a big warehouse at the time and it had a lot of space in it and I decided I can do this in the space without this big expense. And once I did it, I realized, well that's why they don't show pots because they can't sell enough of them. You know, they're not expensive. So that was my motivation to create this space. And I continue to make pods. And in the warehouse, uh, we were located on the railroad tracks in Berkeley. So it was like this a lot of the time. And I called it tracks, T-R-A-X, to indicate that we're on the railroad tracks. But it was in an area where there was no foot traffic, really. There was not even a sidewalk or street out front. I think it was right now. So uh, 10 years ago, we had the opportunity to buy a lot in a very hip shopping area in Berkeley. It was five blocks south of the warehouse. And we did, and we built on it a, a new space. And it was a gallery on the ground floor. The middle floor is our living space, and the top floor bedroom. And it connects by a steel bridge to a rear building. And that's my husband Bob's studio, and we have a storage and an apartment above that. And so the gallery is the foremost part of the structure on the ground floor, and my studio is just behind, and I have a screen I can pull across like the Wizard of Oz and hide there and make my work in the back. And in the beginning, when I first moved, it was fine because very seldom did anyone come to the door. And so I worked <laughs> uninterrupted. And I love that. But now, after 10 years in this location, I'm busy. And it's what I wanted, but it's also a little bit of an interruption to my work, which I still consider my primary focus. So maybe each of you could speak a little bit about what you think um, you bring, or what does the artist bring to being a curator? Because there are, well, how many, let's, let me just quickly get a little show of hands. How many of you are makers in this audience? And how many are curators? So some of you are makers and curators. Are there any who are just curators and, and not makers? A couple who are curators. So what does the artist bring to be curator when we're serious? Trained eye, I would say. I mean, I've been looking at the art for a long time. And I think there's a lot of value in it. When I was a teacher, which I did probably the majority of my adult life, you know, you're forced to talk and interact and speak to students about what they're doing and develop a dialogue around them. And perhaps if I wasn't a teacher, I would have developed in that way. But um, I feel I know a lot, and I feel that I trust my judgment. And I don't curate 
like you do, you know, abroad and in other venues. I just curious if you might get an occasion I've been asked for a pottery show. But I all the time get submissions from them. And I usually give them a critique whether they want it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so do the art the artists that you carry are from all over? Yes, they are. So but not outside of the US because it's just cost prohibitive with I think what we bring is a haptic sensibility. I mean, I believe that's so strong. Um, the way we, um, I know the way I respond to um, a work, it's from almost the inside out, uh, from the construction, from the uh, understanding of the making. Uh, I think more than anything else, that's what um, uh, artists do. I mean, I know curators who are fantastic in the sensitivity to but I feel it's a different sensitivity to the sensitivity I mean. Now, I don't want to sound, you know, hello moon, hello stars about this, because I am not that kind of person. I'm extremely pragmatic. But I do believe that as a, as a maker, you bring this, this knowledge, the knowledge of your fingertips, to it. And that's really, really important. I'd just like to say, I've got these and I can, I'll hand them around. Um, there was recently in Art Review, uh, I think we're talking about the artist as curator here, and I think it's really important for us to think about what is a curator, you know, what, what is the role. If you think about it, the, the word curator actually comes from curate, okay, and the original museums were seen as churches, okay, and the curate looked after the flock, the curator tended to the, uh, the works within the museum. Oh, how it's changed. Uh, now we have curator and superstar. Our review recently, uh, and some of you may or may not have seen this, uh, published their review of the, uh, the Powell 100. Okay? The first four are curators of uh, the public sector. Number one, Hans Ulrich Olbrist, who's his certain time. Glenn Lowry, who I think is um, metropolitan. Hans Ulrich Albrecht, Glenn Larry, Nick Sorota, and Daniel Bernman, four in the world most important people in the arts. Five and six uh, commercial galleries, Gagosian, Larry Gagosian, and Francois Kino. The, uh, then we've got uh, a collector, wow, a collector at number seven, and then uh, some critics at number eight. Number nine, another uh, public sector curator, Yvonne Blatzwitz from the uh, Whitechapel Gallery in London. The first artist is number 10, Bruce Norman. I think that's really interesting. If you think about how it used to be with um, the role of the curator and the artist, in fact, the curator really didn't happen until the first museums uh, at the turn of the, well, in the 19th century. Yeah. Uh, before that, the collector was the powerhouse, the person who actually determined what happened. Um, he would come to the artist's studio, and there would be a negotiation between the artist and the collector. So there would be some kind of, you know, parity of role, although the collector had the money. And then with the museums came the curator. And slowly, slowly, as the role of the museum has changed, so has the role of the curator changed as well. And from being just the person who looked after the stuff within the museum, the curator has become the person who presents the stuff, okay? And how it is presented, how it is interpreted, has become the most important thing. The curatorial eye is now incredibly important. I went to an exhibition in Paris a few years ago with a Japanese curator who was trained in the traditional art history way of looking at work, curating exhibitions. And it was an exhibition with a real curator's eye. It's been picked like this, this, and this to go together. Um, it's about the relationship of music and art. She was outraged. She said, but this is not how it was. This is not an art historical view. This is somebody's view. And people are coming to this exhibition and thinking, this is how it is. And I said, but don't you know about the curatorial eye? And she said, I don't care about the curatorial eye. This is a lie. People will go away from this 
exhibition thinking. This is this is a, this is how it happened, and it's not how it happened. Now this is really interesting. Now we've moved from not just the curatorial eye, but the notion that the whole exhibition has to be performative. Okay, there has to be. I mean, we, we now, we're used to going to an exhibition and reading the interpretation, okay, to understand the object. But in some senses now, the interpretation has become the most important thing. And I would refer you now, and I'm saying all this because it's really important to think about, when we're talking about the artist as curator, what we're entering into, the sphere we're entering into. And um, last year, Anthony Gormley, which some of you may have known about, uh, was asked to curate uh, um, an installation on the 4th Plinth in Trafalgar Square. And what he did was he got people to come and perform for an hour on Plinth for three months or however long it was. 100 days, 2,400 individuals. Was this art? I'm not sure. What I felt very strongly was, and in fact we even have one of the performers here in the room. <laughs> We could actually talk about that, um, or maybe we don't want to. But what I felt very strongly, and this is really interesting, because I actually saw the, the person who, who was one of the performers is also an arts administrator. And an awful lot of the people who did the performing were arts administrators, okay, which I found quite interesting. Um, but what I felt, and Deirdre, you may disagree with me, okay, but what I felt was happening was that when, you have, when we as artists have to fill in funding application form after funding application form, we have to actually show um, how we make it accessible, how we have community involvement. Okay. And here's actually normally the work of art is the accessibility, it is the community involvement. That's what it is. And I thought that was a wonderfully ironic comment that actually nobody picked up on when they were <coughs> critiquing what was going on. So I've just sort of set a sort of a context for, you know, the curatorial debate that we as makers are actually entering into. And I'd just like to finally stop now and think about this with this extraordinary image here of Mixerota. Okay. Self-consciously, and I'm being kind to him here, self-consciously positioning himself in front of Andy Warhol, the Marilyn Monroe. Okay? He even has Marilyn Monroe's hair sort of as a halo. <laughs> And I think, I, I hope he's saying everything that I've just been saying about the artist, the curator, superstar, the transience of the moment, the, icon, the iconic figure, all the rest of it, I wonder. But I mean, that's how it's ended up on, on the internet. So, the, uh, all this, I, you can, I've got some copies of the, the famous Hot 100 here that you can, you can take, but... Uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. What I find disturbing is when I learned, this is in San Francisco anyway, how the curators and the collectors and the acquisitions committee are sleeping partners. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, one of the things that I've been very concerned about is how to ceramics, as we talked about earlier, have broken through the glass ceiling in terms of um, getting good prices for you know one-off pieces. All right, uh, Magdalena Odongo, who is one of my colleagues at, uh, at the University of Creative Arts, um, her pots sell now at Sotheby's for sixty-five thousand pounds, and they're proper pots. They're not racing Perry pots. They are proper pots. They're props, pots that I would die for. I mean, I just love the pots so much. Um, which is great, it's fantastic for, for one-off ceramic pieces. We can't do, we just don't, we don't get there in contemporary textiles. And it's actually identifying, you know, that kind of why. And the why is there are no galleries that um, specialise in contemporary textiles, okay? There are no galleries that can specialise in contemporary textiles. There are no collectors of contemporary textiles. If there are no collectors of contemporary textiles, they're not featured in the auction houses. And they're not featured in the auction houses, so there are no collectors of contemporary textiles, there are no collectors of contemporary, contemporary textiles, so there are no galleries especially specialising in contemporary textiles. It is this circle. I'll stop now. Well, Sandy, what about um, ceramics? I mean, from your experience of running a, a smaller gallery, which is very different from big exhibitions, um, has, do you feel that your gallery, and maybe there are others like it, I don't know, um, that has changed the way the the accessibility for ceramics? Oh, I hope so. And certainly the, te 
technology has changed things. I mean, 90% of what I sell is over the internet and to all countries. And so, um, you know, people generally know the work, and Warren McKenzie is my star, and he's a very well known potter in the West. He's age six now, and he was my teacher. But for whatever reason, he has achieved star status, and people don't even care what they buy because they just want it. <laughs> and it's uh, send a phenomenon. Me yeah, send me something. And honestly, most of the time, it's I don't care what it costs either. And he, for a long time, um, didn't stamp his work. And that was because he wanted people to buy the piece just to enjoy it, not for me. And then people, of course, wanted it. it it's really a strange phenomenon. I'm still trying to figure it out because he wanted this anonymity, and yet, now that he has it, he has to now stamp his work again to make everything equal, you know, because the piece of the few that were stamped went for astronomical amounts of money, and he wanted them to just be accessible to everybody. He'll still sell a teapot for $12, $30, $35, and a little. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the market has taken over. It has largely to do with what you're referring to as the secondary market, and that is eBay, it's auction houses, and this thing that works as an organism on its own. Well, this is a very short session, so we'd like to invite you to ask questions and make comments and be part of the conversation. So, so if we have questions, no ones. <laughs> <laughs> I just I curate the National Park Gallery, which is the Crafts Council Ireland's Gallery, and I'm also a, a maker. I came from fine art as a practitioner, then a curator, and then a track where I'm still of learning. Um, and it seems to me the difference between, say, fine art and fine art, the particular fine art in the UK, is that there's a lot more arts led initiatives, um, a lot more use of space, but they're not in this public office for the galleries. Um, so, for example, in the East End of London, where the people transform their homes into galleries, much as you did, on a very ad hoc and a very exciting basis, it doesn't seem to translate into craft so much, um, particularly here in Ireland. Um, but that's one thing I'm really interested in why that is and, and maybe what it could do to encourage uh, that sort of more experimental artist led initiative within protective craft. Um, and I'm also thinking part of our job is almost to encourage the secondary market and the collector um, markets in craft. So that I make a living, actually make a living. And it's, again, here in Ireland, contemporary galleries don't show craft very often. You know, we're going to struggle to actually get craft in there. And the way that we do it is by hanging it on the coattails of fine art. So that we use language that's often used about fine art. So, and, and this seems to perhaps be parallel to language. Stop it a minute. Um, but I just think in terms of, um, say, for example, the, the, as, as work becomes more and more conceptual, um, International craft in Ireland, there isn't necessarily a conceptual craft strand in the same way. Uh, but certainly, when that language is used for craft, it becomes easier to approach fine art venues and get them to understand what's being done. Um, I, <laughs> I, I love the term, and I think it's very attractive. Um, that's guerrilla curating. Yeah. Um, and it, um, I think then it starts to become exciting. You know? um, I mean, like, you know, the gorilla stores that crop up, you know, I mean, of course it was the Japanese who started it with uh, Conde Castle, but, I mean, this notion of, you know, it's it's very active, you know, it's not passive, you know, we are the, the gorilla girls, you know, uh, as the, the, it was in when the feminists were sort of highlighting the lack of women in the galleries, you know, um, and so I think that's one way, it's how you, it's the way you tell it, you know, it's, it's how you describe what the activity is, you know. And being, I mean, it's, it's very difficult because, I mean, the objects are breakable or they, you know, there are issues about, you know, putting stuff in, in places which are clean spaces, you know, and, it's, you know, thinking about that as well. Well, here in Ireland, it's such a big budget, you know, the, uh, the, yeah, three million euros a year for craft council. That blows my mind. It has to go on so many different well, that's wonderful you get that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you know. Well, I just feel that just to state is that the comparative in the Arts Council 
had been getting eighty two million a year. So I mean there's actually no parity whatsoever between the level of funding the Crafts Council receives and what the Arts Council receives, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the promotion of the arts in the Crafts Council we put in the Crafts. So I think the Arts Council has before we have well yeah. we get theatre and opera and music and uh, many other they do, but I still don't think yeah. that there's an economy to yeah. But that's the same in the UK, just going to say. Yeah. Same in the UK because, you know, Class Council comes under the Arts Council of England. Yes. And actually, we seem to be spending our time justifying ourselves to be equal and justifying, you know, saying that we're makers or whatever we are. But visual arts seems to be at the hierarchy. Um, and it's, it's true, the art effect is not only in textiles, but it, you know, in the UK there seems to be there are maybe some collectors of enduring ceramics that actually were doing glasses, just a couple. And uh, you know, it is a, a constant struggle. And um, it, it's difficult. I, I, I'm a member of a group called the Cohesion, which has managed to go out with Glass Network to be able to go out and exhibit and show those and by being a group in the network and kind of coming together that we've been able to kind of promote the work but actually it's sometimes you think well maybe I should just go to Ikea and buy glass sometimes rather than actually continue with a career in it you know it, it's, a, it's a difficult one but um, curating ones um, you know I work for a university and we have, a, um, we have the Colonnade Gallery in Waterfront in Swansea and we've been handed it over for us to have a, like a, a continual show of work all the way year round, which I'm kind of in charge of. But there's no budget, there's nothing, and it's everything's on the song of the prayer. And it's amazing how you have to stretch it, but actually we're managing to do some nice simple shows that is actually starting to kind of revigorate what's happening regarding glass in that area, that we want to make it more sort of national. And you, you have to find ways of doing it on a street street. Do you think it's also partly uh, a educating your community? I mean, you're talking about starting really. Everything you kind of do, yeah. And also often it always has to be the word community involvement is not necessarily always the best word to hear mm -hmm. when you're applying for things because it, uh, it actually personally can sort of dumb it down a little bit more than actually you want to. When you want to engage and you know there's actually a very intelligent um, community out there and you're suddenly simplifying it down and we have a danger of saying we'll be going to a school, we'll be going to a group. Well, it needs to kind of become more creative in, in how we exploit who we're trying to educate and how we But that takes time. It does. Yeah. 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 And that's, you know, when you start on a, certainly on a collaborative venture like that, you really have to, oh Lord, first of all you have to think what you mean by collaboration, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and secondly, thirdly, more specifically, you have to you know, acknowledge what each can do as well. And then there's the issues of ownership, you know. And um, you, know, it's, you have to get everything out on the table before you start, you know, otherwise there are unrealistic or false expectations. I well, remember that the, the, the South West Show, the travelling show to the South West Glass and Irish artists, and trying to prove to the, uh, to the museum, you know, well, it's going to be three dimensional, be knocked over by children. Nothing happened, but what's happened is that they've suddenly said, oh, yes, we can have shows in that space. And so with low, and like, instead of having the panels right above you, so you couldn't even touch them, I mean, right up here, we've been able to lower them down so they're at eye level, <laughs> and kind of say, well, children will swing on them. It's just like, well, actually, they haven't yet so far. So now we're trying to see how further down we can go. But we've got, it's constant kind of trying to justify that we can make, manage it and, and prove to somebody who's actually curator is actually, that's his, his full-time job, that we can deliver something within his building and to the expectations that he, he, he requires. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, three points, Jim. First one is very optimistic, I think, and there's no doubt at all the curating show does actually create a climate for artists, and it can give a profile to artists, which I think probably doesn't happen any other way. And it's, there's no doubt about it from the, from the tape down. Uh, the curated shows have always made bigger sales for artists. And in the same way that once that starts happening, it goes into the, the, the commercial galleries. Um, for instance, Edward de Waal is showing the present moment in Cork Street, uh, former's Potter. Uh, he sold, I think, everything except one. The last one to sell is 18,000. 
And that's for a cabinet of, of, of cylindrical parts. Very, very beautiful. But the largest one must be part 72 or extra 10, 72,000. We must remember, and this is my third point, that the artist works on 10%. You're jolly lucky if you actually get more than 10%. By the time the gallery's taken their 50%, then you're on a high level. I'm not sure I heard exactly what you said because you were facing forward. I'm not the best ears, but I thought I understood you to say in Ireland, and you might have said in England as well, that there doesn't seem to be um, very many or hardly any at all craft collectors or contemporary craft collectors. And it's our experience in the United States that there's a plethora of craft collectors of all medias, and they're very media specific in some cases. There are fiber collections, you know, um, wood, you know, furniture, or all inclusive <coughs> wood, et cetera, et cetera. And those people are very myopic in regards to that. It's all ceramics, it's all glass, it's all wood, or sometimes it's eclectic. Um, and none of those people suffer from <coughs> um, guilt or envy in regards to the fine art world. They don't seem to have an issue about, you know, craft riding on coattails or wanting to of uh, the fine art world. In fact, they, they could care less because for them, I mean, in some cases, I think it's ignorance because they're not open to the full spectrum of human making and how it can influence and overlay and, and affect craft and craft and affect art. And of course, they're, they're always inextricably connected. But, um, let's see, where was I going with that? Um, they they uh, oftentimes come from a very kind of organic place where some people just love pots or they love clay. Mm -hmm. And when they love clay, it isn't just anything made out of clay. They love pots. They love something about uh, not only the utilitarian, but the, fund the fundaments of interior, exterior, containment, exclusion, the power, the, the archetypal power of that, whether they say that out loud or not, and they're drawn to that. And somebody else is drawn to something else um, entirely, glass, for instance, you know? And, and they're indifferent to clay, or wood, or whatever. And so, um, there isn't that chasm. We're getting to the end of the line with this. We need new, new blood coming through. 
And what we're finding in the UK is that it's the same people that are being seen. And when they go to a show, personally from experience, you walk around collecting, you walk around, and you're seeing the same artists, and you're kind of like, well, how do you get into that? If you can't, if you know that your work's good enough, but how do you get into it? Because okay, well that's a good question to end with, because our time is way past now. So let's just say something. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say something. I think that we become a very quickly stopping right now to the collectors market, and yeah, and the collectors market is a very specific market, and we were touching about you know saying that and that well you know there is not so much people actually self-creating in Ireland and and I think that's that's I think that that's what we really lack in Ireland where actually artists or craft people take their own initiatives to make to create spaces, to create opportunities for themselves, because that is not happening. And I suppose this seminar series that I've been involved in has somehow trying to encourage that and I think that we should be supported in the future because somehow I think the craft community in Ireland is relying on opportunity for craft council. Can't it be like that? You know, um, they have to be encouraged to take their own initiatives, which is not happening. And I don't know how we're going to encourage that, but I think that's something we really have to try to, to try to encourage. And and actually, the, the economic climate that we have today somehow allowing that to happen more, because all of a sudden there is lots of empty spaces in mm -hmm. that could be taken over and could be done something of. But we need to get people to actually want to work together and to create things that have perhaps not always are commercial, because that's something I think is happening in the collector's market, that all of a sudden it is only the commercial aspect of craft that is promoted. And we need to sort of start to also look at issue-based work in, inside the craft council and try to then let the, the community to help them to create exhibitions from that. We're starting a sort of exhibitions fund, we are very modest funding at the beginning because all of our funding has been cut, but it's the start of encouraging makers to self-curate and self-organize. Well, one just small example from my community, um, which I think illustrates how the power of, of space. Um, in our community, there is a small foundation. We had an old, the city had an old public works building that wasn't being utilized. And I worked with this foundation and said, what if this could be made into an art space? And what we created was just raw space. But it was, it was actually a build it and they will come kind of dream. Well, we now have a group of probably over 75 makers who use that space. We have weavers and jewelers and many different uh, makers involved who show, create events and shows in that space. The space is not you know studio space for them. It's exhibit space. It's, it's um, you know, putting on, coming up with some concept that they want to present. Sometimes the community kind of goes, ugh, what is this? <laughs> and other times the community responds with great excitement to it. And what we're seeing is more interest. And yes, this is starting at the very local level, but more interest. These people are not collectors, but they're, they are in a small way starting to go, oh, I just love these silk I've got to have one, and oh, I, you know, the ceramics are wonderful. So I, I think that that creating the um, ability to utilize raw space and have shows that are, yeah, they're not, you know, they're not rock star shows, but they are um, curated well and are bringing people in, and that's. I, and I think that's what I meant by educating yeah. your community. It's so not we've got the same with the Cohesion Network. They kind of, they've started in some of them to work with the council. But because of the recession and the losing and a lot of shops closing, they're now going into the shop space to try and fill it up because they're realizing that they, they need to make it not look so desolate. But it's the artist is a really good way of kind of, uh, of being able to show another side. Okay. Let's have one closing comment. Okay. Well, I just would like to give you one example of, 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 of guerrilla curation, which I think um, is a really, it's really cool. It took place in Japan, and I don't know if any of you have been in Tokyo, uh, but there's a, a particular area in, in Tokyo called Shinjuku. Underneath, there are loads and loads of underground roads, 
pedestrian pathways that all combine at this point. I mean, it is more bit busy than Oxford Circuit, so I don't know what, you're, what the equivalent would be here in Dublin. I mean, it is hugely busy with foot traffic all the time. And a particular artist, um, they then store some luggage lockers in this area because the Japanese are always taking their luggage with them wherever they go because they're always in transit going somewhere or other. So there's a great need for luggage lockers. So they install these luggage lockers, but they're very state-of-the-art luggage lockers. And you actually um, open them by a number on your keypad every time your telephone. All right? And you decide, you would decide what that number was. You'd be given a number to put stuff in, and then thereafter it was a number that you decided on your phone keypad. All right? This artist asked a number of artists to put work in the lockers, okay? And it could be seen by people. They then let people know the numbers of the keypad numbers so that they could open it. Now, it worked in several ways. I mean, at one point, people could exchange work. So they'd go and open it, open the door, take that work out, put another work in, and close it. So it was viral. Uh, so all those millions, and I mean millions of people who were hurtling by every day, didn't know that there was this exhibition of contemporary art going on in these luggage lockers there. But some people did, and the more people did, the more the viral spread. Now, that's what I consider your career of duration, and I'm mean, so excited. Yeah, that's taking something really now and making it so, you know, useful to us as makers. Well, we have that for Yeah. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, you're kind of bogged to we can grow up there all at you can see this. Well, thank you all. I don't want to thank you. Can you say about the exhibition that is opening tomorrow? Oh, yeah. This is very much what we're talking about. Sure. This is about uh, yeah. individual space. space. That um, the, the participants from the, for, from the seminar series, we have been having two exhibitions. One that is in a more contained space, that is, uh, uh, and one that is in the very wrong space, where uh, we have just come together and make, made our work in the space. And it's kind of totally uncommercial space and, and, um, uh, and work that's there. But so it's very much what you were talking about. The yes, a rough space, and, and the space yes. itself is a space for self-creating for artists. Right. Actually, you can rent yourself. So I, just, uh, I have a few invitations here. So if you, um, I don't have everyone, but I put them inside the door here. Okay, and you're very welcome to the opening tomorrow at in six and eight. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.